You ever been watching live sports and you get one of those moments where an athlete wins something, they win a championship, they defeat their opponent, whatever, and they get done and somebody puts a microphone in their face and they just start saying stuff and it's clear that they had not carefully thought this thing through and out comes this glurge of emotion and feelings vaguely related to what's going on or when you watch the Academy Awards and somebody wins something, you can tell the difference between the person who walks up there and is like, I thought of 10 clever jokes (laughs) and they crack everything but try to pass it off like they just thought of it but they can't convince anybody that they just thought of it because even though they just won Best Actor, they're not maybe actually that good at acting. But you know what that looks like versus the person who gets up there like Cuba Gooding Jr. Or I can't think of other examples, but the kind of people who get up there and are like, what, seriously? I didn't even prepare anything. I didn't think I was going to win. And they just start saying things about how happy and grateful they are in this gush of emotion and joy. That is the kind of response that we are seeing in Matthew 21 when Jesus finally makes it to Jerusalem. Clearly, his reputation precedes him. Clearly, the vast majority of people who are there have never met him. They've never heard him speak, but they got a strong suspicion, not even a suspicion. They're willing to put their names and reputations on the line to just gush about how incredible his arrival is and what this must mean. But even the very words that they choose here in Matthew chapter 21 to express how excited they are about Jesus showing up are reflective of an earlier explosion of emotion from the Psalms where something amazing happens and victory is snatched from the jaws of defeat and the psalmist can barely even contain himself as he writes with such joy and excitement and optimism about what has just happened and the hope he has for what's going to happen next. So we're in Matthew chapter 21. Let's break this thing down. So Jesus shows up at Jerusalem. His disciples know he's going there to die, but the people in Jerusalem don't know that he's going there to die. Jesus is like, go get me this uh, donkey with a colt. And they do that. And the disciples come back and they put their cloaks on that that donkey. And then Jesus rides into town on that beast of burden. And then Matthew 21, 8, it says, a very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road. And while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road, the crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, who is this? And the crowds answered, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. There's so much going on here spontaneously. He shows up. Surely his retinue is making huge hype. They're excited to get to the big city, to Jerusalem, for what they imagine is going to be some kind of reckoning. And it's going to be just not what they probably had in mind. And their excitement is contagious, coupled with the reputation of Jesus. And so people come out and they're like, I got cloaks too. Let me throw them on the ground. And so it's like this makeshift flash mob kingly entrance celebration that nobody plotted or made happen. It doesn't look like there was any kind of grand coordination other than Jesus himself saying, go get me that donkey. Otherwise, it just seems like this is a moment whose time has come, a king whose time has come. And what a wonderful and exciting, if very, very fleeting moment this is. Uh, This is the ideal all along, right? Is that the true king would return, that people would recognize the true king, that they would enthrone the true king, bend the knee to the true king, and that the values of the true king would displace the broken values of the pretender kings. And you get dashes of that. You get dashes of that in that the crowds rightly are citing messianic stuff from the Old Testament. One of the really remarkable things about what these crowds spontaneously do is that they recognize that this is a messianic claimant and they go right to messianic ideas drawn from Psalm 118. And I've conveniently bookmarked that in preparation for our conversation. Psalm 118 is one of these psalms of exuberance, of surprise victory, where the psalmist is like, give thanks to the Lord for he's good, his love endures forever, because it was like, my enemies were going to kill me, and I was going to be dead, and then instead, I'm not dead, I took refuge in the Lord, it's way better to take refuge in the Lord than take refuge in princes, they can't help you out, but anyways, everybody was trying to kill me, they surround me, it was totally going to work, they were like bees, they were all over me, I'm about to fall, but you know what, the Lord, he's my strength, and he's my song, shout out to God, shouts of joy. 
joy and victory is resounded in the tents of the righteous and the Lord's right hand has done these mighty things and I'm not going to die after all. I'm going to live. And the stone that the builders rejected has become the capstone. That one's going to come up in just a little while as we keep going along. It's okay if that one's a little bit confusing to you. Don't worry about it. We're going to get there. And the Lord has done all of this marvelous stuff. And we're like, oh, Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. But blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God. He has made his light to shine upon us. You are my God. I will give you thanks. You are my God. I will exalt you. Give thanks to the Lord for he's good. His love endures forever. How many little phrases in there do you recognize from Christian songs and stuff you sing on Sunday morning? Psalm 118 is loaded. It has so many of these remarks of these exuberant outbursts. It's like this thing was written in five minutes and is barely held together by some sort of cohesiveness and instead is just raw, emotional, viscerally fueled stuff, the net of which is God is real and he will deliver and you can count on that delivery. This is the nature of God. God, I am so thankful. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Well, this was regarded by the original audience as a larger chunk of messianic language that give or take encompasses about four chapters right around here. These chapters were read and sung and celebrated at different Jewish feast days. And so I mean, I've told you for ages now in our conversation, like, no, the original audience, they knew about this stuff the same way, you know, about Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader, the same way, you know, all of our recent legends and myths and stories and the things that make us, you know, a bunch of stuff about the DNA of the law of your country and your constitution. They knew all of this. It was a background process that was running in the brains of everybody in this original audience. And apparently it was so pronounced that they all knew to scream the exact same thing. They must've heard this music, this Psalm a gajillion times. And they look at Jesus and they're like, yep, that's the one. That's the one. But what's crazy, and it's hinted at at the very end of this passage we're looking at here, but we're going to see it unfold in a much more pronounced way as we move forward over the next couple of chapters, is that they don't really get the full gravity of what they're saying. They don't understand the Messiah thing. They don't really get what they're looking for. And even though they can see and smell God on this, and even though this is a really fun day, like, I don't know, we got to do something. Let's go on the streets and let's get excited. They don't really get it because when word goes around, people are asking, who is this guy that all the fuss is about? And the answer that was being circulated was, this is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Well, is the Messiah a prophet? I mean, eh, not really. The Messiah is a lot more than a prophet, according to what we call the Old Testament. The Messiah is the completion, the fulfillment, the redemptive culmination point of God. And so though they said messianic language with all of this exuberance and energy, it turns out the reality is that only a few seem to have really understood the meaning of the words they were spontaneously exclaiming. And it looks as though that later tempering, that is, this is Jesus, he's a prophet, is what is mostly going to win the day in the minds of the people in fickle, fickle Jerusalem. So we get this spontaneous outburst of energy and excitement and passion, but it is tempered, even amended in the minds of the people who were saying it very, very quickly. And we need to keep an eye on that detail because noting that is going to help us understand where this narrative is going next. I like you and I enjoy doing this and I think we should probably get this in again tomorrow because it's fun and it's going somewhere. All right. I'm Matt. This is the 10 minute Bible hour podcast. Let's do this again soon.